Uh, all right, shall I get started? Aaron or, or Marcy, do you wanna at least unmute yourself and let me know? Um, yeah, you're welcome to. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you for joining me uh, on this uh, October afternoon. Uh, and it's uh, it's going to be fun to uh, to share with you some 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 new stuff. So, well, I guess uh, it's not entirely new stuff, but it's it's framed in a very new way for me. So, um, so it'll be a little bit uh, raw, I guess, and, and that's good. Uh, so, I wanted to get this talk on systems chemistry, and uh, oh, I guess I should first introduce myself. So, my my name's Tim. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of medicinal chemistry. Uh, and our labs are, are in the chemistry building. Uh, we, we are focused on a merger of chemical synthesis and data science. And so I'm excited to, uh, to meet with the bioinformatics group uh, today uh, and, and particularly share some of these ideas that we have brewing around a concept we're calling systems chemistry. Uh, and you know, we're trying to learn from systems biologists. And so if, you know, if, if, you, uh, if you're an expert in this area, uh, we we would certainly you know uh, welcome uh, your your feedback and and discussion on um, on on kind of the systems concept as we as we try to apply it to chemistry. Uh, so uh, so I want to start here with this idea of chemical space and and you know the, the molecules are these uh, entities in chemical space that do things and the, you know this is what um, uh, a, a lot of uh, industries are are gravitating towards you know a lot of uh, molecules do things, right? So there, there's medicines that's that's from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, there, there's dyes which uh, you know could come from textiles. There's fragrances coming from the perfume industry, and and these are all molecules that have functions. Uh, they're they're molecules that must be synthesized, right? Or well, I guess a lot of what I'm showing here are natural products, but many of these need to be synthetically made. So we need to design molecules and then make them. And 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 this is this is what interests us is is this making bit of it and how that influences the design. And ultimately, what I what I hope to uh, make a thesis on today is how that influences function. That the the, the uh, design, the synthesis, and the function of these molecules are, are, are delicately uh, intertwined um, through through what I call systems chemistry. And so I thought it'd be good to start on this on this super depressing note. Uh, if we go back to uh, forty years to uh, to look at uh, systems, uh, you know, just systems models as a whole. And so uh, so um, Amanabi and Stouffer in nineteen eighty. We're talking about models of, of carbon dioxide and and its role in, in climate change, and you know all of our grandparents kind of said, oh well, you know we'll worry about that in the future. Um, but um, the, this idea that there's you know there's there's systems level complexity that the turning the knob over here has a significant influence of something over here, and so you know like today we're able to think about. Uh, the carbon dioxide system and and cycle and how it influences cycle change and maybe tie that to things like I don't know a fire happening in Brazil or you know an increase in GDP in Southeast Asia or you know lowering gas prices in in the Middle East or something like this that you know that, that it's important for us to understand this at a systems level and how these how these big macroscopic uh, events interplay with each other and so so. I wanted to to explore how that might um, relate to to molecules in chemical space and and how you know how we need to think about where these molecules come from, what it is they need to do, uh, and then from our lab's perspective, how, how you're going to make them. Uh, we're 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 very interested in in how molecules get made, and, and we spend a lot of our time making molecules in my lab. Uh, and so from this, we 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 we've, we've come up with this idea of systems chemistry uh, that. Uh, that we we're thinking of in this way that that you know that 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 these molecules that need to be invented, they they have these sophisticated functions. If it's a drug, it needs to you know dissolve in the aqueous layer of your stomach and then get to maybe get to your brain if it's an Alzheimer's drug and then then interact with it with a disease target in your brain. Uh, and, and these are very complex functions, right? But so, so that's, that's at the function level and, and already this idea of dissolving and getting to the brain is kind of tying in properties which is delicately intertwined with structure. Um, and then I think what we're bringing to the table is this idea that transformations and reaction conditions are, are, are heavily intertwined with all of this. And I think that this is, this is 
this is what is not yet appreciated in 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 um, my uh, experience. That you know, there's there's a pretty clear connection between structure and function. I think that that is well known within medicine. But the idea that chemical transformations and conditions uh, play an intimate role in all of this is is the case that I want to make. Um, and so we're we're looking for ways that we can you know study the connections between transformations and conditions, transformations and structure conditions and function, conditions and properties, um, and all of this. And so I, I want to share a few vignettes from, uh, from work that we're currently doing in our lab, uh, some work that we've published, some that we haven't pu yet published, and, and also some work that I published uh, before getting here. Um, and so uh, I, I'd be curious to, to hear feedback on, on this, if there's people who have expertise in systems biology. Um, but here's my understanding of what systems biology is, is, is largely trying to tackle is that systems biology is, is looking at uh, metabolites, proteins, genes, and pathways and trying to tie that to disease, trying to understand how metabolites and pathways are interconnected and that links to a disease. So from this, I, I draw a correlation to what I call systems chemistry, where we have transformations, conditions, structure, and properties linking to molecular function. So the end goal here is molecular function. We want to have, you know, that Alzheimer's drug that gets to the brain and does its thing. That's its function. Or a perfume that, you know, that, that has a volatility so it lasts, you know, eight hours uh, and, and, it, and it smells um, like roses. That's, that's like, a, you know, a different function that we would try to tie all the way back to transformations and reaction conditions. So let's talk about transformations uh, a little bit. Uh, so th this is... Um, this is an area where we've we've made our first disclosure uh, very recently, and and we're super excited about this idea uh, of of you know thinking more deeply on chemical transformations. I, when I say transformations, what I mean is a reaction. But a chemical reaction needs to have both the transformation and it needs to have the right uh, recipe of reaction conditions. That's what we're actually going to put into the flask so that we arrive at a structure, uh, and that structure has properties that that are linked to its function. Uh, and so I want to go back to 1966. Where I, so another thing that really drives us, and I'll get into this later, is this idea of a robochemist. We love, you know, I'm going to talk about algorithms for a little bit. We also love to talk about robotics. And so um, there's, you know, there's this excitement around having robots make a molecule. So I've been talking about perfumes. I've been talking about medicines. And, and at the end of the day, you know, the kind of Star Trek-like future of all of this is that you get to hit a button and a robot makes the, makes the molecule that you need. Um, you know, you would say, oh, you know, I have this certain type of cancer and you hit a button and, and then a very specific molecule uh, to treat that type of cancer for you comes at the end. I think that, the, you know, this is something that all uh, chemists and, 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 and multiple fields are excited about. Hopefully our grandkids will get to enjoy such a platform. But um, going back to 1966, we were already using robots in chemistry. Uh, and, um, and, and one of the key aspects of this particular robot shown here being driven by Bruce Merrifeld, who won the Nobel Prize for, for these, um, these studies, uh, is the application to the synthesis of peptides. So this is, this is an early peptide synthesizer. Uh, and what is key here is that it's making amid bonds. And uh, so that, you know, peptides are, are, are amides. Um, uh, you, you, you know, you take valine and you click it together with proline. Um, and then you click on glycine, and all of those are, are amid bonds that are being formed along the way um, through, through the amid coupling reaction. And so, you know, I, I, I guess I didn't say in my introduction that I spent nine years working in, in the pharmaceutical industry before I came here, and, and it became very clear to me that the amid coupling is, is by far the most popular reaction used in all of drug discovery. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the most important reaction I think used in, in all of uh, organic chemistry. Uh, and and you know I don't know if I don't know to what degree this uh, this achievement of, of Bruce Merrifeld really seeded um, that that reality that the M coupling is so so important today, um, but it is something that you can automate robotically, uh, and 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 I think that this is um, you know the, the amide coupling has indeed become the most popular reaction of them all. So what I'm showing here is an analysis of pharmaceutical patents. Uh, and pharmaceutical publications. This is this is uh, I, I redrew the pie chart myself, but this is not um, my analysis. You can read about it here from Johannes Bostrom, uh, and uh, this is well appreciated by by any practitioner of, of medicinal chemistry. I think that the amide coupling it makes up the biggest chunk of the pie in terms of individual reactions. So these are these are. Uh, reactions that have been reported in patents and publications towards the development of pharmaceuticals. And what you can do is, is look at all the reactions that are described in these documents 
and start counting them. Uh, and, and what you'll see is that uh, is that you know th there's some that rise to the top. There's some reactions that we just use very frequently in drug discovery. Now the ramifications of that are that you know that reaction imparts a certain footprint onto the molecule. So if you're making an amide bond using the super popular amide coupling, uh, you you know you're going to install a uh, a hydrogen bond donor, you're going to uh, end up with a hydrogen bond acceptor. The, the reaction is a little bit polar, or so the, the, the product is a little bit polar. Um, so that may improve your, your water solubility, but it also is, um, uh, it, it may have issues with metabolic stability. Uh, if, if you're trying to have like a once daily pill, then, then maybe the pharmacokinetics of an amide bond um, are potentially less desirable than, than, than other um, aspects. And so, you know, if, if you've been engaged in pharmaceutical design, you've, you've likely talked about uh, the, the types of objectives that we steer towards, you know, you, you want to pill that dissolves and, and, and uh, has uh, metabolic stability enough so that, you, you know, you, you've got it in your bloodstream for 24 hours, let's say. So the amide coupling uh, is, is, is the most important reaction and it imparts this, this, this set of properties onto the molecule. The Suzuki coupling is, is the second most popular uh, and then followed by um, the CN coupling uh, um, amine electrophile couplings like reductive amination, and then a simple uh, removal of Bakhti protection takes up the, uh, the, the, the fifth spot of the pie uh, before we get into a diversity of all kinds of other reactions. Um, and, but, but in terms of single reactions, the amide coupling eats up uh, one quarter of the pie of all reactions run in, in the $1 trillion pharmaceutical industry. Let's talk about that. So why is it that you are presented with an amine and an acid and you know, more than any other time uh, or any other type of reaction, choose to click the amine and the acid together to form this amide bond. As I articulated, you've got a hydrogen bond donor, this NH, you have a hydrogen bond acceptor uh, with, the, with the carbonyl group, it's a little bit polar. Uh, so th there's, there's a certain amount of you know, properties that get baked into the molecule by choosing this reaction. Now, as I showed, you, know, you can automate this, you can run the amide coupling on robots, that makes it uh, you know, um, easy to, 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 to run in high throughput. Uh, it's a robust reaction, it works, it works well. Uh, and so it, it's something that we choose, but we wanted to ask the question, why? Why, why, why is this the one? Why is this the reaction when it turns out that there are many other ways that you can click these two pieces together? So you can take an amine and an acid and you can have them unite uh, for instance, in this in the top left corner here, uh, through a decarboxylation to make a CN bond, or maybe you could do a deamination in this next molecule to make an ester bond, or maybe you could do a deamination decarboxylation and make a carbon carbon bond. Um, there's you know maybe ways you could do an alpha functionalization of the amine or an alpha functionalization of the acid, beta functionalizations. The list goes on and on, and you can see that we have like these cute little notation systems to try and help us keep track of all the possibilities. It turns out that there are many, 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 many ways that you can click together an amine and an acid, and almost all of them are completely unknown. But what's, 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 what resonates from that is that each one of these has a unique set of properties, right? So starting from the same two molecules, we can arrive at something that is basic. We can arrive at something that is acidic. We can arrive at something that is super greasy or something that is super polar. And these types of properties are gonna influence the function of the molecule. They're, they're gonna influence whether the molecule goes to the brain or whether it goes to the liver or where, whether it just goes straight through the kidneys and out into the toilet. Um, and so these are, uh, these are, I think, important questions to ask and, and why we wanna to drive towards this idea of systems chemistry and think about how does the transformation relate to the properties? So we, we went through this enumeration. Um, uh, we, we have a pretty simple algorithm for, for uh, tying this together. So you take uh, an amine is, uh, is, is drawn on uh, in, in these little circles where we have an alpha carbon, a beta carbon, and A is the, is the NH2 in this case. Uh, and, uh, and then similarly, the acid has either a, a B, you can, you can add onto the oxygen or you can add onto the carbon. You can add onto the, um, the, of the carbonyl rather. Uh, and then uh, you can also add in the alpha carbon or the beta carbon. Um, uh, this is just to show that you know this. It, we're doing this for amine and acid here, but it's completely abstractable to uh, to any pair of functional groups. Uh, you could have a case where you lose the amine, you could have a case where you lose the carboxylic acid, and you could have a case where you lose both the amine and the carboxylic acid. So if you play with this algorithm, uh, you build out all the possible transformations, and then and then we we arrive at a, a fun visualization like this. What I'm showing you here is 320 transformations. Uh, that are new ways that you can connect an amine and an acid together 
uh, and they're almost all completely unknown. And, and, and the way this visualization works is that if there is a purple line or, or, a, or a yellow or blue line that is tying the transformation, which is, uh, which is numbered one through 320 around the periphery of this circle into one of the known drugs or natural products in the drug bank database. What that means is that all of these reactions, wherever you see a purple line, that is a reaction that could be used to synthesize a drug or could be used to synthesize a natural product. However, that reaction does not yet exist with the exception of maybe a dozen of these. Um, these are unknown reactions. And so that is, uh, I think that's, that, that, that's our opportunity, right? These are all reactions that could be invented. Uh, and, um, and, and, and that's, that's, that's something that inspires us. We get excited about you know, the, the possibility to invent any of these new reactions. Um, and so we, we, we've done some of this. We've, we, we wanted to ask the question, do reactions control properties? And, and we show that here. So, so I, I, uh, the students in the lab took um, uh, uh, p-toluidine and ortho-toluic acid, these two simple molecules up top. They clip them together by the amide coupling uh, and you get this molecule uh, in a 91% yield using oxalic chloride and, and triethylamine as our reaction conditions. Uh, that gives us the amide bond, which is you know, the, the way that you're supposed to bring together an amine and an acid. Um, but we found that you could also do this reductive coupling where you, where you arrive at a, at a basic amine. Um, you could do this, this kind of uh, strange cyclization event um, where, we, where we use this iodobenzene catalyst and oxone and um, this, uh, this, this forms this tricyclic rigid molecule, very aromatic um, fluorescent molecule. Um, we can do an ortho functionalization with loss of ammonia. Uh, and that gives us uh, this molecule down here in the bottom left corner. We can decarboxylate from there and then get this, this super, super greasy um, biaryl molecule. Or we can do a deamination and form the complementary ester to the amide. And, and this is a neat reaction for us because it's, it makes a molecule that's got the same shape uh, and, and a very comparable electronics to the amide, uh, but it's got one fewer hydrogen bond donors. So the molecule in the bottom uh, right corner is very much like the molecule in the top left corner, except that the NH is swapped for an oxygen. And that has ramifications uh, in terms of the permeability of, of, a, of a molecule into getting into cells, uh, and particularly for crossing the blood-brain barrier if you were trying to make a brain targeting um, molecule. But, but the, the, the cool part is this, right? So that what I'm showing you here is the spread of available properties from clicking together this amine and this acid. Um, the, this is a, a kernel density estimate that shows that the spread of available molecular weight log P, uh, which is a marker of, of the lipophilicity of these molecules, and polar surface area, uh, which is kind of a marker of their, their hydrogen bond um, accepting uh, characteristic. And the gray lines represent all the different molecules here. So what you can see is that for log P, for instance, we're spanning almost from two up to like 3.7 or something like this, almost, almost, uh, almost two full orders of magnitude um, we, can, we can access in terms of lipophilicity, which is going to correlate with the ability to get to the brain or to have good metabolic stability versus poor metabolic stability. Um, all of this is done simply by changing the reaction conditions. And this, this, is what, this is what inspires me. This is what I get super excited about with this idea of of systems chemistry is that we have we have attempted to make something that is perhaps brain targeting by changing reaction conditions, and and I think that that is that's you know what, where this whole thing comes together as a systems where we tie uh, transformations to conditions to properties to structure and function. Um, then then you know the idea that you could have a catalyst that makes a molecule that is liver targeting and a complementary catalyst that makes a molecule that is brain targeting is something that is, is, is really exciting to me that you know that you could you could hit the liver or the brain by by choosing nickel or palladium from the periodic table uh, is is one of the things that we're you know we're, we're trying to drive towards um, so that's that's an example there of of tying transformations to properties um, and, and this was uh, the first report from our, our, our new lab um, we were very lucky to be able to publish this in the journal nature and we're, we're obviously very proud of that uh, accomplishment. I want to talk now about reaction conditions um, and go back a little bit into um, my, my career in industry and, and also um, you know, bring, bring it forward to, to what we're doing here in Michigan. Um, but I have a, a long uh, history of, of exploring reaction conditions using robotics and, and algorithms. Uh, and I'd like to talk about that, that with you for a little bit and show you, show you how that fits in. 
So, um, I mean, the, the the summary of this is is, is shown here. We, we, the uh, uh, you know the, the punchline is that we like to run miniaturized reactions. We run we run lots of reactions on a super small scale, um, and you know by miniaturizing we we get to uh, we get more information density out of our experiments. Uh, it's it's the whole Moore's law um, approach to to chemical synthesis here. And so we've been trying to miniaturize and get more and more information out of our reactions and start to study things on this systems level. Um, and the details have been published over the past uh, five years or so. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and, and getting into the weeds of, of, of how this works, right? So, that, so we, we, we think about running reactions in a flask. We do this in my lab all the time. Uh, we, we love to run reactions in flasks. Um, but, you know, that, that burns through a lot of material. Um, it's, it's, you know, it, it takes up real estate. We, we have precious real estate, especially these days with social distancing in the lab. Um, and so uh, it also burns up, you know, very expensive reagents. So, so we would like to miniaturize and get smaller and smaller. So, you know, more frequently uh, when we're working in our lab, we're, if we're running a single reaction, we're going to do it in one of these vials. That's not new to us. Every every lab that does synthetic chemistry uses these types of vials. Uh, but here, you know, we can start to miniaturize and use uh, less and less material. But um, one of the one of the tools that we use a lot is these so-called micro vials, which are the the, the two rightmost vials here. Um, and these are these are really really small little glass shell vials that we put tiny little magnetic stir bars inside. Uh, and then we can run reactions on like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, on, on, the, on the bigger of these two vials, we would use between one and four milligrams. Um, and in the smaller of the vials, we would run, you know, kind of like half a milligram or one milligram reactions with a tiny little adorable stir bar inside. Um, and so um, we, th this, is, this is what we do in our lab. We call it high throughput experimentation. Uh, and we have miniaturized even further, uh, as I showed on the previous slide, down to running this in 1536 well plates. Um, th that's really um, a, a story in engineering uh, to, you know, to, to try and make these reactions that, that operate in, in volatile solvents. Uh, with, uh, with reagents that, that may be poorly soluble uh, in the solvents that we want to use. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they, 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 uh, they tend to be devilishly reactive with plastics. And of course, the, the whole realm of, of automation and well plates is all, all, all in the world of plastic. Uh, but, uh, but anyways, we, we've done tons of engineering on this and, uh, and, and have published on this quite a bit. Um, here are some early pictures from building the lab. Uh, so we, we do this all in an inert atmosphere glove box. So here's um, Anna and Bo uh, doing uh, experiments inside of our glove box. So the reagents that we want to use are, are very sensitive to air. They will decompose rapidly if exposed to air uh, or moisture. And so we need to protect them from that. Um, they, um, they, you know, sometimes they'll like burst into flames and that's, that's certainly something we, we certainly don't want. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we use lots of uh, pipettes. Yeah, I, I anticipate a lot of people on the call um, would question why I would show a picture of, of multi-channel pipettes. Uh, but uh, for us in, in our community, that is a relatively novel concept. As, I, as I've alluded to, we work with volatile solvents. We work with stuff that will decompose plastics. And so, you know, the, the realm of multi-channel pipettes is not well integrated with synthetic chemistry. And so a synthetic chemistry lab uh, that, is, that is doing this type of high throughput experimentation um, is, is, uh, is, is somewhat unique. Uh, and, and that's, uh, that's you know, we, we have this kind of like mixed engineering challenge and data science challenge of, of handling all the data that comes out of these things. Sometimes we shine blue lights on stuff um, that, that can make reactions uh, work differently. Um, we have a, a series of robots in the lab. Um, this uh, in the top right corner, you see this one with the little green uh, footprint um, is what's called the mosquito. And that's what we use for running our, our 1536 well experiments. We do our analysis. Uh, oh, the mosquito is shown down here in the bottom left corner. Uh, it's, these are like little tiny little tips uh, that dose at the reagents. You can imagine that there's a red, blue, and yellow reagent. Um, this is uh, meant to uh, honor the uh, Colombian flag um, for my, my dear friend, Alexander Butrago Centinia, who did, did some of this work uh, and is a very proud Colombian. Um, and we do the analysis by HPLC mass spec. So we run lots of reactions and we analyze them by HPLC mass spec. So we get a mass spec readout. Did the reaction work, yes or no? Um, and then we get lots of data, right? So we can run 1500 reactions in an experiment that gives us lots of data. And then we, then we start to process that. And so, you know, I, I, I'm excited to be um, interacting today with the bioinformatics 
uh, community. We, you know, we we aspire to to be um, uh, engaged in the chemoinformatics world, um, and as a synthetic chemistry lab uh, that that is heavily invested in Python, I think that that's that makes for a pretty fun interface uh, of research that, uh, that that's ongoing in our in our space. And so. Um, uh, here's here's Bo um, working in the glove box, not wearing a lab coat. He's supposed to be wearing the lab coat while he's doing that work, and hopefully he's he's learned from that mistake. Uh, but Bo wrote this uh, this beautiful software called uh, Factor in in collaboration with uh, with a lot of um, help in our lab. And I just want to introduce this. So so we're gonna do we're gonna do reactions on robots, or frequently. I mean the the plates that are glowing blue down here. These were all set up by hand using these multi-channel pipettes. Uh, this is most frequently how we set one of these up is we set up uh, 24 or 96 reactions. Uh, and then when we when we have a system that we understand quite well, then we start plugging into the 1536 uh, capability. Uh, but but all of this is an exercise in data handling. And so uh, so one of the first things we wanted to do when building the lab was to to build an information management software, which we call Factor. So Factor is a software that uh, that has been written in our lab. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're trying to decide what to do with it now, and, and I would welcome feedback from, from anyone who has experience here. So we, we have like a software that we've written. It's really cool. It, it does everything that we want. Um, there's, there's a lot of people that are interested in a software like this. And so the question I guess is that we're up against is like, do we, do we try to make some money off of this or do we just go open source uh, and, and let the community um, have at it? Um, and you know what we're, we're at that decision point right now if you have uh, if you have experience here I, I would love to hear from you either in the Q&A or, or, or please do reach out afterwards but but factor is is a information management software that helps us drive these experiments um, so you design your screen in factor I'll show that to you in a second and then you decide are you going to set it up manually or, or send it to a robot in any event it's going to um, it's going to be sent to a UPL CMS for analysis in our lab we, we could easily plug in other analytical techniques, but we use UPL CMS. Uh, and then, then you get the output data from which you can perform your analysis and decide if, you know, if your objective has been satisfied or if you want to go back into Factor and, and run a uh, follow-up screen to learn from the data. And we're, we're um, actively engaged in, in pushing you know, the, these loops to be driven uh, algorithmically so that you know, you'd have like some type of active learning reinforcement loop that says, okay, here was the output of that experiment. That tells me what to do for my next experiment. And then I learned from that and then we go forward. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're doing all that kind of stuff, but I'd say right now we're, we're, we're just getting really good at the, the engineering part of this right now um, and setting this up. Um, so you know, right, right now running screens in our lab is you know, something we, we can do very easily. Um, we can hammer out um, a little 24 well screen like this, a student can can have the idea for, uh, and then with using factor um, in in a matter of, of minutes, can set up the recipe and and uh, and have you know full documentation of the experiment moving forward. So um, I'm showing just a screenshot here of being a few steps in, where we have a recipe grid uh, shown with these these pretty colors on the side. Um, and all the different bars represent the different combinations of, of reagents that are going into each of these wells. These reagents are things like shown uh, in, in the left here. So indium bromide, scandium triplate, aluminum chloride, uh, tris pentafluoro, uh, phenyl uh, um, uh, borate is, is, is one of the ones that we, um, that we use. So, so someone here must have been looking at a uh, Lewis acid screen um, for a particular reaction that they were interested in. Uh, and all of this takes moments to set up. It's it's connected to our inventory, um, and and really we we were really striving for like a really user friendly experience when designing this software. Uh, and um, as you click through, you you get to um, you get to the data, right? So so I, I mentioned that um, that we're going to do all our analysis by UPL CMS. We get a number of different endpoints out of these the, this technique. So we get you know we get retention time. Um, we get uh, area um, uh, integrations of, of the different peak areas from our HPLC uh, using, using either mass spec or UV. Uh, and now uh, we're, we're just now setting up a, a technique called ELSD so that we'll have multiple different ways we can look at individual peaks. Um, and then the data is automatically fed into factory. You, you can drop down uh, from the different, uh, different readouts and look at these uh, different heat maps. And, uh, and we, we, we like to kind of have this triptych view where you have three of them 
uh, side by side because that can help you to say, okay, like this one is showing me, uh, you know, the the disappearance of starting material. This one is showing me the appearance of of a particular product, and this one is is uh, showing me the appearance of a side product that I don't uh, I don't want to be in there. Uh, and so we use this to kind of you know visually inspect the data and try and understand where to go from there. Uh, here's here's a case of this esterification reaction that I that I mentioned earlier when we were talking about transformation. So we have um, we have a diazonium salt which has been prepared from uh, from uh, from the amine. So we, we do this activation of the amine. We're going to click it together with an acid, and we're not going to do the amide coupling. That's our trick, right? We're trying to take amines and acids and do not amide couplings. In this case, we were trying to uh, optimize this esterification reaction. And so Yuning Shen in the lab uh, took factor, designed this screen uh, where she was looking at, uh, at at a series of different ligands. Uh, so pyridine, DTBPY, triphenylphosphine, and xanthos, and, and a series of different metal catalysts. So copper iodide, palladium acetate, uh, nickel uh, chloride with or without silver nitrate. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we then go physically set up this experiment in the glove box manually. Uh, and analyze the results, and then we get a readout like this. So this is a typical uh, readout from one of these screens. Uh, here, pyridine with copper iodide and silver nitrate are the best conditions to run this reaction is what we learned from this screen. Uh, and then we've taken that further uh, and, uh, and, and optimized this uh, to, uh, to reaction that works actually uh, very robustly across many different substrates. Um, and, and that's something that I show here. So Yuning and uh, Bo partnered on, on plugging this reaction into our mosquito software uh, and, um, uh, and, and generating uh, a lot of uh, reaction data for, uh, the sub for exploring the substrate scope of this reaction. So here, what Yuning has done is taken four different uh, diazonium salts uh, three of them, the, the bottom three shown here, are derived from amine drugs. So here's sulfadoxin, uh, sulfoxazole, and uh, metoclopramid. Um, these, are, these are various drugs that we were able to get our hands on, uh, convert to this activated um, diazonium form, and then, and then Yunin can clip them together with any one of 96 different uh, carboxylic acids. Um, she chose to run this in quadruplicate because we really wanted to get a readout on, on the, the reproducibility of this reaction. And so when you interpret this heat map, you're looking at four, uh, four different uh, replicates for the same reaction that are clustered in a little square. So uh, hopefully you can see that there's, there's kind of like a little bit of pixelation to each, uh, each square. And so if the colors are exactly the same, then that was a wholly reproducible reaction. There's a couple instances where if we look over here at like 08, in the bottom right corner, um, there's a purple. There's a purple well, meaning that 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 reaction did not work. And whereas the other three replicates for that particular instance did work. Uh, so you know we do encounter scenarios where where we don't get perfect uh, reproducibility, but uh, nonetheless we we're, we're quite happy with this. I mean I, I think across 1,536 reactions, uh, you can see that there's there is pretty good fidelity uh, between um, you know from one reaction to the next. Uh, and so this gives us faith that these reactions that we're running on a super tiny scale, we run these on like 0 0.05 milligram scale, uh, which is very small for, for a synthetic chemist, uh, is, um, uh, is reproducing. And indeed, we, we then uh, take these and then go scale them up in lab. And so Yuning has done that very beautifully here, uh, where she's demonstrating the substrate scope of her, her reaction. So these are all reactions that were run um, on that super small scale. Um, using using uh, conditions that we uh, we eventually optimized up to uh, co uh, copper uh, BF four um, two four six colidine uh, in in uh, acetonitrile. Um, actually, we ran it in benzonitrile for the screen, but we tend to run the reaction in in acetonitrile. Um, and uh, and here uh, here you see these are reactions that were run uh, on large scale. So these are reactions run on 25 or 50 milligram scale where Yuning has, has done the very classical uh, reaction in a flask uh, or at least a large vial, um, put, the, put the reaction mixture onto uh, a column chromatography to purify the mixture out and then you know, got a white powder at the end and gone and weighed that on the balance and said, okay, you know, for the coupling of P-toluidine with, with N-Bach valine uh, here, I, I get an 80% isolated yield on, on 25 milligram scale. 
Um, and so, th I mean, this is this is very rewarding, right? Because it tells us that we can we can explore synthetic chemistry on a super teeny tiny scale. We can generate lots of information, but then that information is going to translate to the larger scale where we traditionally run things, and we're ultimately going to need to run things if we want to, you know, get our hands on these molecules and actually do something with them. And so, Yuning has shown that this works for lots of simple acids and simple amines, and also a few complex uh, amines and complex acids. Um, uh, shown here. So, um, so uh, here's sulfadoxin coupling to n Um This is a uh, glyceritinic acid, um, which uh, you, um, there was there was like a, a kind of a sorted um, headline in, on CNE news, uh, CN, CNN recently um, about a man. Uh, maybe you read about this. A man died from eating black licorice. So, a man in Massachusetts was eating a bag of black licorice every day. Um, and, uh, and, and, and he died, um, unfortunately, for after, after like six weeks of eating black licorice um, candy, you know, every, all day, every day at work. Um, he died from an overdose of the, of the carboxylic acid that is shown here. This glycerotinic acid is, is one of the main natural products that is found in licorice. Um, and it, I think it you know, probably has anti-inflammatory um, activities when taken in, in moderate dose, but you, uh, you can overdose on it as, uh, as, as sadly we now know. Uh, but anyways, it, it works uh, very well in, in uh, Yuning's uh, reaction. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're really inspired that this reaction works well on, on simple acids, simple amines, uh, complex acids and complex amines. And, and I think that's going to, that really points to um, what we call the substrate scope. And we want this thing to, you know, to have a good substrate scope so that it can be used in lots of different settings. Um, so, uh, so I'd like to now try and tie together transformations and conditions for you. So we've been talking about conditions for the last little while, uh, and and I've been showing some chemical structures. Uh, but you know, we started talking about transformations that we want to hack the amide coupling and have you know have non-amide couplings to wait to bring together amines and acids. And we showed how how that links to properties um, and how how careful selection of the reaction conditions is important for that. Uh, and indeed, that that ties to structure. Um, and then we know that structure and properties are intimately linked to function. And so there's, you know, there's this web of, of interactivity that, that is exciting to us um, that we're trying to explore here within systems chemistry. I want to take a little bit of a detour right now and talk about uh, the interplay of transformations and conditions. Um, and so, you know, I showed you how we're hacking transformations to think about amines and acids. And, and that's what I would call a single reaction, right? Where we, we, um, we have the amide coupling, and I just showed you Yuning's uh, esterification coupling. So we have like an amide coupling and a complementary ester esterification coupling. Those are, those are single reactions. But you can make a lot of molecules with a single reaction, but lots of times you have to string together several reactions to make a new molecule, like a, a drug, right, is, 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 is a pretty sophisticated little molecule. It needs to have um, a number of reactions that have been strung together in a sequence to build it and we call that uh, retrosynthesis, or we call the analysis of these sequences is, is called retrosynthesis. And we've been engaged in this, uh, in this idea in partnership with the company Millipore Sigma. Um, and, and most recently, you know, we had, to, we had to take a very significant pivot on this to address um, uh, what, you know, to do what we could to address the COVID crisis. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we've been uh, very actively engaged in exploring uh, the use of retrosynthesis and automated retrosynthesis and, and artificial intelligence within a uh, within retrosynthesis for the discovery of new molecules and new reactions. Um, along comes February 2020, and uh, and you know we're, we're we're all stuck at home on Zoom, right? So um, so uh, we we needed to. Um, uh, think about how we could use our talents and, and, and the things that we were working on to address this global uh, pandemic that we find ourselves in. Um, and uh, one of the things that became immediately clear and, and it was, you know, that, that Millipore Sigma uh, quite urgently reached out to us on. So Millipore Sigma is a, is a chemical supplier and they realized that the supply of chemicals that are used to make the drugs that are needed for COVID-19 uh, is, is going to run out. Or, or is 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 threatened and will be stressed, right? And we, we ran out of um, toilet paper and hand sanitizer and macaroni and cheese, and these are like low tech products. And so, you know, a drug that's going to like find its way to your lung tissue and uh, and and attack a virus, an alien virus, and then have like the metabolic stability needed so that you can take like a once daily dose. That is a high tech product. Right, so so if we're running out of the low tech products on shelves, imagine what's going to happen to the high tech products. And so we wanted ways to uh, to come uh, to these molecules 
um, there would there would be like a backup strategy. And so the the question was this is this is going back to March, right? It wasn't known which molecules we should care about. Today, you know, remdesivir is a molecule that gets talked about, uh, and as is uh, dexamethasone. Or these these are drugs, but you know, I, I, I say there are currently uh, 3,100 clinical trials. Um, this slide is maybe uh, four weeks old, so I don't know if that's um, uh, if that number is still accurate, but there there are a lot of clinical trials under uh, underway right now to explore the uh, repurposing of diverse drugs for COVID nineteen, and if one of them should turn out to be the one, uh, we may need a billion doses of the thing. Right there, there is not a billion doses of many drugs on this planet. I doubt if there's a billion doses of any drug on this planet. So we're going to need more than one way to make these molecules. Um, and so, uh, so I want to talk about the interplay of reaction uh, transformations and reaction conditions as we get into this. And so what I'm showing you here are four uh, such molecules um, that uh, you may have heard, uh, uh, heard of on the news. Uh, so remdesivir is one that is, I, I say it's approved here, it's actually got, it doesn't have a full FDA approval, it has um, emergency authorization uh, use, uh, but remdesivir is one that, that you've heard about. Um, and, uh, and then bromhexine is, is a TEMPRS-2 inhibitor, uh, which may have relevance. It is being studied uh, in five clinical trials. Umafenivir is actually a coronavirus attacking drug. It was, it was um, designed in the, uh, the SARS-CoV-1 uh, outbreak. Um, and favipiravir, as well as another antiviral protease inhibitor, uh, which could have relevance. And so it's, it's being studied in 27 clinical trials towards uh, coronavirus. Um, uh, and so what I show down below are, are, these, are these reaction networks. And the way you interpret these is, uh, is the yellow dot in the center of each of these webs is the molecule that is drawn up above. So the, the yellow dot here is remdesivir. Um, this yellow dot is, is uh, umafenivir. Uh, and um, what is shown below in the, the, the gray uh, lines leading to orange circles are sequences of reactions that are used in the patent and uh, public literature uh, to make this molecule. So these are recipes that one can use to make umafenivir, and they arrive at these starting materials that are orange dots. And so our, our hypothesis is that the world is going to eat up all of the supply of these orange dots, and we need other ways to, to make these molecules. We need a way to get umafenivir if we run out of the, the starting materials that are the orange dots. And so we partnered with Millipore Sigma. They have a uh, artificial intelligence called Cynthia uh, that is a software that enables one to do retrosynthesis and break apart a target molecule into new pieces. But we wanted to um, use it in a very unique way. And so we trained their software to, uh, to look for starting materials that are not these orange dots. And so what you see going up top are routes that we have designed uh, using Cynthia that arrive in, in these pink dots. These pink dots are starting materials that are different than the starting materials that are down here. So if we if we burn through all of the supply of the, the orange ones, um, then, then uh, we are providing recipes uh, to, get, uh, to get to these uh, potential uh, COVID drugs uh, via the pink dots that, will, that you know, will hopefully relieve some of the stress on the supply chain. Um, and so, you know, when I talk about the amine acid coupling um, and how, you know, that's like a single transformation, oftentimes what we need to do is string together many transformations to get to a sophisticated molecule like remdesivir or bromhexine or favipiravir. Uh, and so each one of the, you know, purple or pink dots is, uh, is a different intermediate uh, and, and the arrows uh, are connecting them are reaction steps along the way. Um, and uh, going up from the literature, we have the, you know, the, the uh, orange and gray dots. Um, the gray dots are intermediates um, that, are, that are already reported. Um, and so what we have here is a recipe for, uh, for, for a backup uh, to, uh, to do this molecule. And I just want to show you the experimental execution of some of this. Uh, so here is umafenivir, um, the, uh, the, the final target shown here, um, drawn all the way over on the right. Uh, here is the network of, uh, of uh, 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 routes to this molecule, both the, uh, the existing uh, routes from the literature and our sequences. Uh, which are, are drawn uh, this time uh, flipped uh, 90 degrees, so they're drawn uh, from left to right. Uh, and so at this point, I mean, th this was this was where we did, you know, like kind of uh, MacGyver type stuff. That was uh, that was um, uh, it, it was a type of science I've never done before because this was happening in late March, early April. Uh, we so we you know we we were uh, we were one of the first labs uh, in in uh, we were the first lab in our building to reopen. 
um, to start doing research. And we were one of the first labs on campus to reopen to start doing it. You know, there was very little known about how to, how to do chemistry in the lab uh, in April. Um, you know, we bought walkie talkies. We, we, um, our, our, our sponsor, Millipore Sigma, uh, was able to find us N95 masks. Remember how difficult it was to find a, an N95 mask in April. Um, and uh, so, uh, so you know, we, there, were, there was like a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of like boot camp, you know, like uh, hit the ground running to, to perform this. Uh, and, 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 and all of it is done due both to the scientific bravery, but also just the personal bravery of uh, Ying Fu Lin and, and Rose Zhang, uh, who are two extremely talented postdocs in our lab uh, who perform this work. And so what's shown here is uh, we had performed the analysis of, of, uh, of uh, routes towards uh, umafenivir. Uh, and then Ying Fu and Rose went into lab and actually demonstrated that our, our AI predicted routes worked. And so, um, so uh, they, each one of these is a reaction that they executed in, uh, in the month of April or May uh, and showed that we could, we could, you know, we can really do this. We can take these molecules that are our starting materials that are not used in the, uh, in the existing syntheses of umafenivir, and we can use uh, predicted conditions from the AI to actually make the uh, the molecules and 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 get us to our final product, um, and so should we run out of of umafenivir and need to make more of it, this, these are these are four uh, different recipes that we are providing uh, to uh, to make this molecule. And I'm highlighting uh, one of these particular reactions here that Rose was working on. We're trying to connect uh, a molecule 45 to 47. Um, and uh, this is a reaction that wasn't working particularly well, but we have this, this infrastructure in our lab of Factor, uh, the software for, for driving um, high throughput experimentation. We have the, the actual uh, physical hardware for, for doing high throughput experimentation. Um, and, uh, and so Rose couldn't get this reaction to work very well um, using some, you know, some simple uh, experiments. So we, we then ran one of these reaction screens where she takes uh, the, the two partners that need to be coupled together and look at different copper catalysts, different ligands and additives. And what Rose found was that copper iodide um, with uh, this ligand L1, which uh, is not shown here, the structure of L1 is not shown here, but it's, it's a kind of sophisticated uh, tetrazole ligand uh, with, with, with no additive was actually the best, um, the best set of conditions. And then, and then she performs this reaction on, on a traditional scale uh, and, and got a 66% isolated yield of that, which was, uh, which was uh, satisfactory for us to move forward on that. So, um, so that's kind of our time together of, uh, of uh, transformations and conditions. Um, I'll, uh, I'll quickly jump into some work that I did at Merck uh, before, uh, before joining Michigan, uh, where we we're looking at condition structure properties and function. Um, and so here what we wanted to do was to, uh, to look at nanoscale synthesis and how it applies to biochemical function. So, uh, you know, we're, we're running ke synthetic chemical reactions on 0 0.05 milligram scale, super tiny scale for chemical synthesis, but, but a pretty decent size scale for biochemical analysis, right? So, we, you know, we were running these reactions and getting an LCMS readout on whether the reaction worked yes or no. But we realized there's plenty enough material in these reactions to also get a readout on if there is, you know, biochemical affinity of, of the products of these two uh, to various protein targets. Uh, and so we used a technique called affinity selection mass spec. Um, I won't get into it in detail today, but um, you can read about it uh, here. Uh, and um, uh, but we can feed our crude reaction mixtures, 1,500 reactions at a time, into this ASMS assay, and then do this affinity ranking experiment, which again I'll, I'll skip the details of today, to uh, determine what is a good rea what is a good reaction and a good binder to. Uh, we, we looked at kinase proteins, um, and then what uh, what I, what I show here is just the fidelity between our um, our super small scale reactions on the on the x axis. Uh, where the crude reaction is dosed directly into the biochemical assay uh, in correlation to a traditional 50 micromolar scale purified reaction that is then, uh, then performed in a, uh, in a traditional uh, KI assay with, with you know, purified um, reconstituted DMSO stock solution. Um, you can see that there's like pretty good fidelity between the two different techniques. Uh, and so what this means is that we can get the same information on a super tiny scale. Uh, but here we're tying together reaction conditions from the nanoscale synthesis um, all the way to uh, different uh, structures and properties and ultimately to their function, in this case, affinity to a kinase protein. Uh, so I show that here. Um, these, are, these are somewhat uh, complex visualizations, which I'll, um, I'll go through a little bit quickly as I've got just a minute or two left. 
Uh, but um, we ran 19 reactions, and the 19 reactions are shown as the as the blue and yellow squares in this in this like one dimensional heat map. Um, and then those reactions are then fed directly into this affinity ranking ASMS assay. And what we're looking for is the yellow dots that go all the way down to the bottom. Um, if they're down at the bottom, that tells us it's going to be a potent compound. Um, if they're if they if they're one of the purple dots up at the top, then we then we then we uh, would say that that's a low affinity compound. And indeed, we we run the reaction on a on a traditional scale. Uh, in this case, isolating a forty nine percent yield uh, that gives us the thirty five nanomolar compound, uh, which was the yellow dot circled in red here. Uh, and then uh, this other example, we we run uh, on a traditional scale, purify the compound, get a thirty eight percent yield. Uh, that was the purple dot that's circled in red here, and that is that is off uh, you know off the charts. We we can't measure it. So um, so this is exciting for us, right? Because now with 0 0.07 milligrams or sorry 0.7 milligrams of material. Uh, we can get information about reaction conditions. Does the reaction work? Yes or no. Uh, and we can get information about the function. Does the molecule bind to the to the uh, protein that we care about? Um, then we start to expand into more dimensions. And so, uh, so what I'm showing here is uh, is screening reaction conditions a bit more uh, aggressively. In the top panel, we're looking at a Suzuki coupling where we're looking at. Um, 18 different coupling partners uh, going from top to bottom, uh, and then eight different catalyst systems uh, to try to find the right catalyst to connect these molecules together. And then if the molecules connect together, then we get to feed them into this assay uh, and, and you know, hunt for the, for the yellow dots. Uh, in this case, the yellow dot circled in red is this compound here, compound five, which is 59 nanomolar, so a pretty potent molecule uh, compared to a impotent molecule, compound six, which is the purple dot here. Uh, we did the same thing um, with uh, with this other series down below, where again, we're you know we're screening lots of different reaction conditions on super small scale. 170 reactions are run with just nine milligrams of material. Uh, we feed that directly into an assay. Uh, we can we can separate out on a super small scale, you know, the the, the binders, the 23 nanomolar binders from the from the from the uh, you know inactive compounds. And uh, if you're engaged at all in the design of molecules as uh, protein inhibitors, then then you know hopefully you can appreciate why that would be a fun thing to do. Um, and then then we start to get kind of you know uh, start having fun um, uh, with this. Um, this is this is you know how I spent my paternity leave was teaching myself how to how to code with a with a baby in my lap. Um, and, and make fun visualizations like this. Uh, and, um, and so what I'm showing you here is 3,000 reactions that were run on 123 milligrams of material. And again, we're looking for reaction conditions that'll give us the desired products and then, uh, and then feed us uh, into this assay where the closer we get to the center of the circle, the more potent the molecule could sh should be. And so you can see that you know, these amide uh, coupled reagents uh, bring us closer to the center of the circle. And, and so those are, those are uh, compounds that we would, would want to follow up on. But if we look at this segment of the pie that says alcohol, um, most of this is up in the purple dot space, meaning that most of these alcohol coupled products are inactive uh, and we, we don't need to spend more time there. Um, and uh, but but you know translating conditions to function is 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 the point here, right? So what I'm showing you here uh, is is a different visualization of that same library, where we have uh, we have uh, a chemical space. Uh, 384 compounds are shown in principal component analysis space. Um, if you're not familiar with that, that's fine. Just uh, trust me that uh, that that each one of these yellow dots is meant to be a molecule. If it's a yellow dot, it means I got the molecule. If it's a purple X, it means I got a 0% yield and I did not get the molecule. So we run the reaction under a single uh, condition, a single reaction condition, and a whole lot of these molecules are purple Xs, right? So more than half of the molecules uh, in, the, in this pie uh, did not get made. We got a 0% yield. We did not get to feed them into the assay. We don't know if they're good molecules or not because we didn't get them made. Them. Uh, instead, we, we then run four conditions because we have this ability to explore different um, experimental dimensions uh, using our high throughput experimentation techniques. And we look at four catalysts, and you see that we can turn on the vast majority of these molecules. We can turn the purple Xs into yellow dots. And we get 92% of this molecule, uh, this library of, of compounds gets made. And then that tells us more about the, the, uh, the, the chemical space. But what's, what's important here is, you know, here's like kind of one of these links between conditions and function. So the conditions uh, uh, under, under panel A gave us a 0% yield. 
we explore different reaction conditions and we find, uh, we find the set that turns these molecules on. Um, and then we feed that into the assay and we find these four molecules down below. So these are four molecules that were a purple X on this side and they turn into a yellow dot on this side. And these are all uh, relatively potent molecules for this assay. A 17 animal or compound is a pretty good compound. And so these are compounds that would have been missed, right? That, that like potent biochemical function um, is intimately tied to this unique combination of T butyl bretfos, MTBD, and DMS as solvent. I mean, that's like, you know, that's, that's like a palladium catalyst that is now being tied to the function of this molecule. And, and, and I'm excited about, you know, how we can tie all these things together. Um, and I'll just, I'll quickly close out with, a, with one last vignette from our, from our most recent nature paper um, that, that brings these four things together. We have not yet brought all five of these together. And that's, that's what um, we're, we're very heavily involved in in our lab is, is tying together transformations, conditions, structure, and properties to ultimately drive function. Again, my, my goal is that we could have a palladium catalyst that sends a molecule to the liver uh, and then a complementary copper catalyst that sends a molecule to the brain. I think that that would be like a really, a really cool thing to be able to control. Um, and so uh, I, I show you know, a little bit of a, a prelude to, to, uh, to, to getting there. Here, so here are uh, three sets of different uh, molecule pairs where we take a complex molecule, uh, we click it together in, in the amid format, but also in, in a non-amid format um, and, and get these different structures uh, using different reaction conditions uh, that, that influence the, uh, the transformation and ultimately that gives us different properties. And so, um, so here, here are uh, uh, some of these property sets um, for for uh, complex molecule pairings, um, where there's this huge span of property space that one can access simply by changing the transformation, and you can experimentally realize that by changing the conditions that changes the structure. Um, and so there's this like this this deeply intertwined network of of transformation condition structure and properties that that is tied to function. Um, and I am trying to understand, you know, how that how we can how we can study this at a systems level, how this can how this can play together. Um, again, you know, we're, we're trying to learn from systems biology and the impact that uh, that, it, that that has had. But we are, you know, I, I'm, I'm a classically trained organic chemist. I, I don't really know very much about what systems biology is, and, and I would really welcome uh, any feedback um, uh, from uh, from from this audience. Uh, and uh, and with that, um, I, 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 I want to thank uh, my super talented group. Um, uh, I showed um, uh, work from from a number of them today, uh, and we have a number of uh, great industrial sponsors who uh, who you know help pay the bills, but also um, uh, you know make make uh, uh, doing this work fun. Um, so with that, um, I will uh, thank you and stop there. And then um, Marcy or um, Aaron, I don't know if um, <laughs> if we take questions or yep. if I just... anyone has questions, um, they're welcome to. We have a few minutes left, so um, feel free to unmute or in the chat box. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much for giving your talk. That was excellent. We, Great. we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Take care.